15 years ago. Do you remember? Let's think back. 15 years ago. What were you doing 15 years ago? What was your life like? Does it seem like that was a long time ago, or does it seem like yesterday? It's easy for me to remember 15 years ago, because at that time I was taking on a new job as a pastor of this church. (laughs) February 2008 does not really seem like that long ago. 15 years ago, not that long, 15 years goes by quickly. I remember some of the early conversations that we had with the deacons at the time, and I asked them what they thought this church would be like in five years, what they thought it would be like in 10 years, what they thought it might be like in 15 years, and Several of them laughed at me and said, well, I won't be here. (laughs) And some of them were right. A lot can happen in 15 years. And as we come to our passage from Acts 13 this morning, it's been about that amount of time since the day of Pentecost and the birth of the Christian church. So if you take that in the entire context of the history of the church, that's really not a lot of time. Acts 13 is still very near the beginning of the whole movement, but steadily the church that Jesus promised to build is taking shape. In our brief text for today, we get a glimpse into taking shape, in particular in three and in its authority. But before we get there, let's check in with the author. What do you think? Our Father, we thank you for your and we ask for grace enough today for us to be able to hear it, receive it, benefit from it. Amen. Acts 13, 1, now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul's. The setting is Antioch, Syrian Antioch, where believers from North Africa had been preaching Jesus to the mostly Gentile people in the city of over 500,000 people. Now, this Antioch is a pluralistic place. It is a center of trade. It is a literal intersect routes, not far. Um, people had received the gospel in response to this evangelistic winters, Barnabas to shepherd great success. And of his name Saul, who we know now as the Apostle Paul, to help with the discipling in Antioch and the fellowship grew as the gospel did what the gospel does. It bore fruit and it multiplied. So Antioch now has a true church and In that church, there were prophets and teachers, men gifted for these roles by the Holy Spirit. Luke gives us their names. Barnabas, we know a little bit about Barnabas. We've studied a little bit about Barnabas. We first read of him in Acts chapter 4. He is a Levite. He is from Cyprus. Simeon, who was called Niger, which is Latin for black, gives us the indication that wherever he may have come from, Simeon is a black man. Lucius from Cyrene, a city in Libya, may also have been a black man. Manaean, a friend of Herod, that means he was a privileged high society man, central Turkey. So, and Saul was a Jew and a Hebrew of the Hebrews, but he was from that area in Turkey. Luke gives us this, and it's subtle, but it probably would have been less subtle to the original readers of this story. And if we take just a moment to reflect, which we're going to do, we can see the image that Luke is trying to paint for us here of this unlikely band of brothers. They hail from all over the region. They are ethnically diverse. They are culturally dissimilar. And yet God has joined them together to make them into a church. And how has he joined them together? What is the common denominator that pulls them together? It is Jesus Christ. These men would naturally have had many differences and many distinctions. And if you ever have traveled out of the country... 
you can appreciate the reality of such differences and distinctions. How many of you have traveled out of the country and gone to, to foreign places? Some of you don't want to admit it, apparently, but the rest, I don't know why you're so bashful. You should raise your hands and, yes, yes, I travel. It's fine. Bonnie's in the Dominican Republic right now. You go to the Dominican Republic as part of our mission trip, and one of the things that happens in your mission training is you get trained about things you can do and things you shouldn't do. Things you should say and things you shouldn't say. Ways you should behave and ways you should not behave. Every culture has its own set of rules. Every culture has its own distinctives. And as we read this list that Luke gives us in Acts chapter 13, we're seeing men who come from these different cultures with all these differences and with all of these distinctions. And yet they are united. They are united through Jesus Christ. Christ, because what they have in common is greater than anything that could separate them. So Acts 13 is a sampler of sorts. It's a foretaste of the church as it's shaping up. This is how God is building his church. This is what the Christian church is becoming and what God has all along intended the Christian church to be. It is God's real will. Matt read it for us in Ephesians chapter 1, to unite all things in Christ. This is what God is doing. This is the work of God in the world, uniting all things in Christ. To unite all things is to gather together as one. Everything in heaven, everything on earth, under one head, one Lord, one King, the King of kings. It is God's will to break down the walls of hostility that separate people and to bring men and women from all people groups, all languages, all countries together, uniting them in Jesus. That's exactly what we're seeing in Syrian Antioch. So let me ask you, friend, what are we seeing 2,000 years later in Ellsworth, Maine? We could make the case easily that given our demographics up here, it's almost impossible to be ethnically diverse. We could make that case. Few would argue, uh, anybody that looks around very much, uh, in regards to race and ethnicity, that Maine is a uh, melting pot. <laughs> we're, we're just, we're not. Right? Any, any study of the demographics will, will say that there is a high, high, high percentage of the population is Caucasian. So racially and ethnically Maine is really not a cultural center. It is not at all a diverse region. But let me put it to you another way. The makeup of the church and the leadership in the church in Antioch was representative of the population of Antioch. Is the makeup of this church representative of the citizens of Ellsworth or of Hancock County? And not just racially, but socially, socioeconomically, stage of life, um, status in life. The church at Antioch is growing in its diversity, and that is a good thing because it's how the Lord planned it, and it's how the Lord is building it. And their multi-ethnic composition is a powerful witness to the world. It is a continuation of the unity in diversity that we see at Pentecost, when the words of the prophet Joel are fulfilled and the Spirit is poured out on all flesh. And that was the beginning of the Christian church. Now, if you fast forward in the book of Revelation, Revelation 5, 9, where praise is given to Jesus, we read, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. This broad inclusion in the kingdom of God is good news for us Gentiles, don't you think? It ought to be. It is. 
And so it is for any and for all. The church of Christ is not homogenous, nor is it is to be discriminating in terms of race or ethnicity or social standing. Brothers and sisters, God casts a wide, wide net when he fishes for men. A wide, wide net when he fishes for men. And we, likewise, want to be casting that same wide net. Let us strive here always to be a church where persons from all stations of life are pursued and are invited and are welcomed and become a part of us. The church is taking shape, becoming what it will be, and we see that in its diversity, and as we have seen previously, the church in Antioch is taking shape in terms of its ministry. It is doing what biblical churches do. The gifts of the Spirit are in operation there. And we saw already the church is generous. The church is a sending church. And now we see that it is a worshiping church. Acts 13, verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. While they were worshiping, who that they is in this verse, actually you cannot tell um, from the text. It isn't clear. It's up for debate. It could be a reference to the five teachers referenced in, in the uh, verse before it, or it could be a picture of the church in which those five were ministering. That's what I think it is. I think what we have here is that the latter. I think what we're seeing here is a picture of the church at worship. The believers are worshiping and they are fasting. Does anybody know what it means to fast, other than maybe to not drink coffee before your blood test? Does anybody know <laughs> what it means to fast? You think, of course we don't know what it means. What we're known for here is how much we eat. Fasting is to refrain from eating for a specified time, for a specified purpose. And it really was a fairly common practice in Jesus' day. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about fasting, and he assumes that those who are seeking God will fast. He doesn't have to direct anybody to fast. He assumes they're going to fast, and he even tells us how we ought to do it. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 to 18, And when you fast, not if you fast, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. You know, how spiritual are you? Fasting and all. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is not a formula, but it is a promise. Our omniscient God sees our fasting as well as what drives it, as well as the motivation behind why we might want to do it. Are we fasting because we're seeking God, or are we fasting so people will look at us and say, well, how spiritual, how religious, how good of you to skip a meal? Hebrews 11.6 says he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Proverbs 8.17 says, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. We fast not to be seen by anybody in our fasting, but to seek God especially. We fast. Now, if there was a special need in the church at that time, if there was a circumstance in the fellowship, if there was a problem to be solved, if there was a direction to be discerned, we have no evidence of it. F.B. Meyer wrote this, This momentous prayer meeting had apparently been convened to discover the Lord's will as to further developments. And in truth, I read that and say, apparently, there's nothing there to make it apparent. It's possible. But you know what's also possible? It's possible that fasting was just part of the way this church worshipped. That's what's possible. That this is something that they just did. To view fasting and prayer as something we do only when we're at a loss, when things get tough, that's understandable. There's nothing wrong with that. Go to God. Recognizing always extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures, but I guess what I'm suggesting is maybe this didn't, doesn't need to be so extraordinary. That fasting and prayer could be more 
ordinary, more the norm, more a matter of course, less the exception. Or if I can push this just a little bit on you and say we fast and pray only when we have a need. I want to ask you, friend, when is it that you haven't a need for the wisdom and the power of God in your life? Is, is, is there a time, is there a moment, is there a, a span where you would say, well, I don't need any wisdom today, I don't need any power, I don't, we, I, we always have need, don't we? We're weak, we're broken, we're flawed, we're imperfect, we don't see things always clearly, we always have a need. It's one of our biggest problems, don't you think, that we can actually get to a place where we don't feel our need for God? That we don't feel that we need His wisdom, that we don't feel that we need His power, that we can, we can become successful in business, we can, be, we, can, we can become lucky in love, we can raise kids who are smart and always do what you tell them to. We can excel in athletics in any number of ways. We can work really hard with natural giftings, hardly work at all, and be elevated in the esteem of others and even ourselves and begin to believe that hype, forgetting the role that God plays, the giver of good and perfect gifts. So you wouldn't have anything, as Paul said, what do you have that hasn't been given to you? You wouldn't have anything if God didn't give it to you. But we forget that, don't we? And I think you will agree with me that when we get to that place where we have forgotten that, we find ourselves in a dangerous time. Those have been dangerous times for me. When the roots of pride, self-sufficiency, begin to take hold. Actually begin to believe that you're the one doing it. But we can avoid this. A desirable alternative to that self-sufficiency is for us to be shamelessly prayer dependent, to lean on God, to lean into God, to take our cues from God, to make our moves because of Him, to turn to Him for His answers instead of just asking Him to bless our choices. Are you guilty of that ever? I mean turn to him for answers instead of just bless, asking for the blessing on the choices you've already made. I've done that. The reason I don't consult him is he might say something different than what I want. <laughs> but when it gets in motion, I want a blessing. We need to get back behind that motivation and say, I need to turn to you for answers first. I really want... To have, I think you really want to have that spirit in Moses who, who before God says, if you're not coming with us, I'm not going. If you won't go with me, I won't go. That's how much I need you, God. That's how much we need him. To be shamelessly prayer dependent to fast and to pray. Our vision in this church, one, one aspect of our vision is to be a praying church. We try to live this out a number of ways uh, with our prayer meeting. Hopefully someday soon we'll have two prayer meetings, our prayer chain, our corporate prayers and worship. We try to spend time in prayer in our discipleship groups, in our Sunday school classes. The house of God, the temple of God, the people of God should be a house of prayer. That was one of the things that Jesus had against the the Pharisees and the people in the temple. They had taken, taken the house of prayer, supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, and made it, into a, uh, made it into their own little place of commerce. Methodist minister Samuel Chadwick has said this, the devil fears nothing from prayerless work, prayerless studies, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our wisdom, he mocks at our toil, but he trembles when we pray. God wants his people to be a praying people, amen? amen? Fasting and prayer are not habits to pull out in a crisis, but they are spiritual disciplines that we can engage in as a matter of course with regularity, practices that keep us close and dependent on our God. And this church in Antioch is fasting and the church is praying. It seeks God and God speaks. 
So maybe this is a little too obvious of, of an application or implication. I don't mean to offend you, but listen, if you want to walk in God's will, if you need a, a word from God, if you're here today and that's, that's something you've been struggling with, I need a word from God, let me just suggest that you should give him your full attention. That's what the church is doing here. In Psalm 27, the psalmist says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. If you are here today and you consider yourself a seeker, you likely have looked for answers in many directions. And yet the promise of God is this. If you will seek his face, if you will call upon him while he is near, while he may be found, he will reward you. He will answer you. You will find what you're looking for. That's what happened in Antioch. And the people worshiped and fasted, and the Holy Spirit spoke to them. And in this instance, he gives a very clear message. He says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. So we have seen the church now taking shape in regards to its diversity, in regards to the exercise of its spirituality, its ministry. And finally now we see the church taking shape in terms of authority. I find it curious, uh, maybe you do too, that the Holy Spirit here in Acts 13 is, is, speaks to the church gives his commands to the church. This is one of the benefits of slowing down with Scripture and just reading it and trying to understand it. What is going on here? Who's speaking God? Who's he speaking to? The Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, is speaking to the church. Why not just speak to the individuals? Why not just speak to Barnabas? Why not just talk to Saul? There's precedent for that. It has happened before. Oh, I'll give you a good try. <laughs> Baby needs a break. Why not just talk to Saul? Why not just talk to Barnabas? Why not talk to the individuals? There is precedent for that sort of divine intervention so far in the book of Acts. We've seen it. Think about Philip. Think about Peter. Think about Cornelius. Well, I think what's happening here is we're watching and witnessing the Holy Spirit's chosen method, message and audience, is directing himself and vesting authority in the church. We've watched so far as the role of deacon has been developed, starting in Acts chapter 6. We'll see as we get deeper in here how the elders, eldership is being developed. And just as those are taking shape, so too, I believe, is the role of the church in the expansion of the gospel taking shape. God works through his people. God works through his gathered people as his people obey. And he is choosing here to commission his missionaries through the church. He's giving them a job to do. It is the church given the imperative, you set these men apart for me. Barnabas and Saul Think it through now, beloved teachers. They've been there for a year, more. They've helped these Christians grow from the start of their faith to now. Set them apart for me. I'm going to send them. Maybe, maybe God's speaking to the church because he understands how connected we can get. And he's saying, yeah, but don't forget, this is all about me. It's not about you. He's choosing to commission his missionaries through the church. It's a church that's going to pray and lay hands on them. It's a church that will stand behind them. It's a church that's going to send them away. And the church that's going to eagerly await a report of their missionary activity. A couple weeks ago, I asked you to imagine the local church as the wellspring of mission. This really is, to me, a fundamental tenet in Baptist polity. The local church as the fundamental unit of mission. The, the, the work of God comes out of the assembled people. God chooses to work through his church. He chooses to work through the local expressions of it. 
So let me, let me ask you to ponder something, doing my best to make sure it doesn't sound like a rant. Because if it's a rant, it's automatically disqualified. But if I ask you to ponder it, God intends the church to be the place where people are trained in Scripture, in its application, in its implications. But in formal ways, at least, we have largely handed that over to seminaries. He intends the church to be the place that recognizes and ordains for service ministers of the gospel. But we have often given that over to denominations. He intends the church to be the place that sets apart and sends missionaries. But we have, over the last few hundred years at least, given that over to mission boards. He intends the church to be the group that renders aid to those in need, but we have given that over to community funds, to nonprofit charities, and to government social services. None of what I just mentioned, none of those things are bad. None of them are wrong. Each has their place. They work beautifully in conjunction with the ministry of the church. They're only problematic when they take the place of the church, or perhaps more accurately, if or when we allow them to take the place of the church. And therefore, where we have, it's likely that we need to reclaim and reestablish our God-given duties. So in wrapping this up, we see from our passage this morning the Christian church is taking shape Developing in terms of its diversity, in terms of its ministry and its authority. In truth, though, you know this, don't you? The Christian church is always taking shape. <laughs> Think about this church and the shape it has now. Think about 15 years ago and the shape it had then. Dare, if you will, to think 15 years into the future and the shape it might be. The Christian church is always taking shape. Since it has been formed, it is constantly being reformed. Needfully so. And each generation is blessed, and you and I are blessed to, to truly have a hand in the shaping of God's church. So I would suggest that we not be passive about this, but that we, that we not be careless or thoughtless about it at all, but do our best to see that this church, would you... Would you Stand with me here, that this church, in this place, in this day, is going to be biblically molded and is going to take the shape that God wants it to take. The shape that he wants for us, just the way that he, he, he had a shape for the church in Antioch. When it comes to the composition of our membership, the priorities of our ministry, and the exercise of our authority, in preparing and sending workers out into the kingdom harvest. And as we prepare to go this morning, let me put an edge on the blade by uh, reiterating 10 exhortations that uh, we would call them implications, applications from David Platt's address to Pastor David Platt, author David Platt, his address to Southeastern Seminary some years ago, related to the scripture that we've been studying together. This comes from, this is sort of his synopsis or summary of um, how to respond to Acts chapter 11 and 13. So Platt's got 10 exhortations and, and uh, there's, there's, they're excellent. So why not share them with you? Number one, let's raise up ordinary people in the church who'll do extraordinary, extraordinary things in the kingdom. Number two, let's embrace suffering as a God-ordained means for the accomplishment of the Great Commission. In other words, if we're going to be effective in sharing this gospel, in some ways it's going to hurt. And let's not see that as something to be avoided, but something to be embraced, because that's what it costs to share Jesus. Number three, let's penetrate lostness through externally focused, intentionally faithful proclamation of the gospel. Get a little wordy, David Platt. Let's penetrate lostness through externally focused, intentionally faithful proclamation of the gospel, which is code for get out beyond these four walls and preach Jesus. Number four, let's not build our ministries on counting decisions, but on making disciples. Number five, let's lead churches to go aggressively after spiritual needs while giving sacrificially to physical needs. 
You see, James talks about that. You can't say to somebody, go and be warm and not give them a coat or go and be well fed and not do something to help them be well fed. That's not faith. Faith without works is dead. You've got to have both. And that's what Platt's suggesting we read about here in Acts. Let's go aggressively after spiritual needs. Social justice errors on the other side. You're not talking about spiritual needs. They're meeting all kinds of physical needs. So we can't go there. But let's go aggressively after spiritual needs while also tending to physical needs. Number six, let's love the glory of God more than we love our own lives. Number seven, let's fast and pray in desperate dependence on the Holy Spirit. Number eight, let's raise up and send out brothers and sisters from the context of the local church. Let's stop measuring success according to how many people we can get into our building, but measure success by how many we are leaving our building to take on the world with the gospel. Number nine, let's trust that intentionally making disciples inevitably leads to multiplying churches. And number 10, let's leave a legacy of disciples made and churches multiplied around the world for the fame of God's name.